uh, as uh, as he introduced that uh, I'm uh, I'm a neurosurgeon and uh, I'm mainly working on the uh, brain computer interface technology. So I'm the consciousness itself is not uh, my main topic, but uh, <clears throat> I'm also interested in this area as a clinician. And also uh, today I'd like to discuss how the BCI can uh, be uh, useful uh, to evaluate the consciousness or uh, study the consciousness. <clears throat> So let me start from the uh, what the BCI and what we have been developing. Uh, so we, we are using this kind of in invasive uh, brain signal. So we implant uh, uh, electrodes for the human brain and uh, uh, record the brain signals of the uh, logical surface. And then using this kind of ECOG signals, for the uh, BCI purpose brain computer interface. So uh, this uh, video shows the, the example of the BCI using the ECOG electrodes. So uh, uh, when we implant these kind of electrodes, we can obtain the, uh, this kind of activity patterns from the ECOG signals. And uh, uh, we can instruct the subject to uh, move his hand and uh, uh, record the brain signals uh, based uh, corresponding to each different type of movement. And uh, uh, when we apply the uh, machine learning technique or AI to uh, classify these patterns of the activity, uh, we can infer that what type of brain, uh, what type of movement was performed by this patient from the issue of these signals. And using that, it, in for the information, we can control this kind of robotic hand. So patient can control this robot through his brain signals. So this is the uh, BC, base, basic idea of the BCI. And this kind of BCI can be applied for the communication and the rest reconstruction of motor function of the severely paralyzed patient. And actually we have been uh, uh, apply this BCI technology for the uh, severe paralyzed patient. Uh, for example, this is the uh, example uh, that we did in 2013. We implant this kind of surface electrodes for the uh, severe LS patient and evaluated the, uh, the performance of BCI using these electrodes. Hideaki Tashiban is 61. Six so, years ago, uh, he there. was diagnosed with ALS, a disease that causes the progressive degeneration of the muscles. Yeah, so he's a patient uh, with the severe paralysis, and he can move his, only his eyes and the mouth, and usually he makes the communication using the uh, movement of his mouth. And then we implant the electrodes this for him like this, Unless it is in exactly uh, your brain, uh, uh, can control this robotic arm. Uh, try to control this robot hand. Grip the ball. Yes, you're doing well. Now release it. Yeah, and also he can we write try out words on a computer, somewhat. just using the power of his brain. He'll be trying to move the cursor over the keyboard on the screen and then get it to stop at the right characters. First, he tries to write the five characters for Konnichiwa, Japanese for hello, but he just can't get it right. So, the doctor makes numerous small adjustments to the programming. Finally, Tachiban gets it right. So, uh, we, we, we succeeded to, con uh, the, the, this patient succeeded to control the robotic hand and type one using his brain signals, even, uh, even though he cannot move his own uh, hand and body. And uh, also this kind of technology is developed in late after this study. And uh, uh, this is uh, one of the recent uh, 
recent study from the uh, Germany uh, group. Uh, they implanted uh, these tiny needle electrodes to record the uh, uh, motor cortical activity and uh, supplementary motor area activities. And using this signal, uh, they try to communicate with completely locked in patient. So complete to total locked in state is uh, that the patient lose the all, all, all muscle activities. So there are no way to communicate with them uh, in, in a form of the muscle activities, but uh, uh, we can communicate using the uh, brain signals uh, even in such totally locked in state. So this is, so this patient can no, control locked. this uh, yeah. tone of the sound based on his brain activity. And uh, this patient tried to uh, uh, yes. spell something, uh, spell yes. the word uh, yeah. by using this uh, ESL. The actual Satz is Mixafilsuppe mit Fleisch Marion Leg L O S. Yeah, yeah. apparently th this is a very time consuming uh, process, but uh, uh, he can select one uh, each word. Uh, one by one, and uh, actually he succeeded to type 1.08 character per minute. So one character per minute, uh, and uh, but he can spare something like uh, my biggest wish is a new bed, and uh, tomorrow I come with you, you for bar barbecue. So th these kind of long sentence can be made from using this uh, BCI. So uh, BCI. Uh, enables the subject to show his consciousness through this communication. So, uh, so because the today's topic is the consciousness, so I I like to discuss about what the consciousness is. So maybe you all, all most of you uh, know this uh, to that the, this consciousness level. So the, there's two kinds of consciousness, the level of consciousness and the contents of consciousness. So one is the uh, wakefulness and the other is uh, awareness. So uh, wakefulness is just a uh, wake and sleep cycle. So with a patient uh, opening, op opening their eyes and the, uh, awareness is the, the awareness of their environment and the, or themselves. So in the, the locked in syndrome, so that the patient, something like this patient is, is uh, uh, ha having the mostly uh, uh, normal consciousness, but uh, they just losing the, the motor ability. Okay. But uh, on the other hand, there are some other unconscious uh, patient, something like a, a so-called vegetable state, vegetative state. So, or unresponsible wakefulness syndrome. So for these patients uh, uh, showing the wakefulness, so they, they, they open their eyes and uh, they, they can sleep. Uh, they, they have the sleep-wake cycle, but they do not show any uh, res reproducible responses for the environment. For example, when we ask something, they, can, they do not respond improperly. So, uh, they, so, so, so to, to show the consciousness, uh, people need to uh, make some responsible, reproducible responses to the, uh, the environment. But the BCI uh, can change that kind of diagnosis of unconsciousness. So, because the, uh, uh, BCI can detect the, uh, con the brain, change, brain activity changes without motor function. So we can see uh, how, how the subject is responding to uh, the, the environment, even without the motor responses. So uh, for example, this is the very interesting um, uh, uh, research. But uh, uh, in this research, the uh, the, the subject were asked to imagine the uh, 
something practicing tennis or working in the house. And uh, for example, in a healthy subject, uh, imagining these two kinds of different images induces very different brain activities. So if we measure these brain activity using fMRI, we can distinguish uh, the, the brain activity uh, clearly between these two different images. And when we apply this uh, technique or uh, fMRI recording for the unconscious state patient, we can find some patient can respond uh, reproducibly uh, in this fMRI scanners. So we, we can find the similar activity patterns for the question to imagine the practice tennis or working in a home. So we can find some conscious response in their, in their brains. So, so uh, BCI can overcome our OD limits. I mean, the, uh, so without BCI, we, we need some voluntary control of our muscles to show our consciousness. But uh, uh, using BCI, uh, we just need to we just need some controllable brain activities to show our consciousness. So we don't need uh, our body or muscle activities. And we just need the controllable brain activities to show the consciousness. <clears throat> so uh, BCI will be will change the way to evaluate the consciousness itself. Okay, and, and also uh, BCI is a, uh, uh, a uh, good uh, neuroscientific tool. Uh, it's a very useful tool. So, uh, uh, these, uh, because the the this BCI, uh, the performance of BCI depends on the how much the subject can control the brain activity. Uh, BCI can measure the controllability of brain activity relating to uh, certain brain function, and. Uh, uh, BCI can evaluate the brain activity in the artificially simplified system. So we can evaluate the, evaluate the uh, brain activity in a very simplified condition using the BCI. For example, uh, we can record the motor cortical activity of the monkey, and uh, uh, we can evaluate how much this brain activity uh, can change or uh, can be changeable, controllable. And uh, uh, to evaluate this, uh, if we don't have the BCI, we need to evaluate the, the motor cortical activity with the monkey body. Okay. So the monkey, the monkey motor cortex or motor system has the very different type, very many kind of the parts. So motor cortex, of course, and also cerebellum or basal ganglia and uh, spinal cord and uh, uh, muscle activity or some, sometimes bone. So these uh, elements have, uh, have the nonlinear dynamics and uh, very complexly uh, interact with each other. So it's sometimes difficult to uh, control these uh, effect from the uh, muscle activities or bones or something. So, but uh, using the BCI, we can simplify the relation between input and output. So, for the BCI, the all, all input is the is a uh, uh, recorded signals. So we know all inputs. So only recorded neurons affect the system. And also we 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 know all relation between the input and the output in the BCI condition, and uh, these are controllable for experimenters. And also the all inputs and outputs are recordable. So, so using a BCI, we can simplify the system uh, and uh, to, we can evaluate the, the motor cortical activities in that simplified uh, uh, conditions. <clears throat> so uh, for example, this, uh, this nature, uh, study, uh, they recorded the motor cortical activity and uh, uh, showed that uh, 
the motor cortical activity is restricted in a, a small sub, subgroup of the activity space, and the, the, these are called uh, neural manifold. And uh, when they try, when they uh, assign the, the assign the castle movement uh, to 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 make the different direction of the in this subspace and uh, see how the monkey can control their brain activity to in in each directions and especially um, when they when the the sub monkey try to control their brain activity in this manifold they they, they can easily control their brain activity to 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 move the castle, but the, when they assign the, the castle movement to the outside of the manifold, this cortical activity is difficult for the monkey and they cannot learn. So uh, they, they show that uh, there are different difficulties in these brain activity patterns from in the monkey. Okay, so, and also uh, the, the, these kind of BCI is a uh, uh, useful tool for to improve the neuropsychiatric diseases. So actually, uh, BCI training has been shown to improve the motor function of chronic stroke patient. So it, it, it can be used for the clinical purpose. So, oh, sorry for it takes so long time for the introduction. But uh, so I'm, I'd like to discuss today <laughs> how the BCI affects our consciousness. So uh, I'd like to address two questions. Uh, can BCI change the awareness of ourselves, such as body perception and pain? And also, can we control our cortical activities of visual perception by imagery to show our imagery contents of the BCI? Okay. To show that uh, I have two, uh, two topics, BCI treatment for phantom limb pain and the visual imagery BCI for uh, communication. Okay, well, the first, uh, the phantom limb pain. Okay, the phantom limb pain is a neuroplastic pain characterized by pain in the amputated limb or pain that follows partial or complete deafferentation, such as brachial plexus root aversion, like this. And uh, it, it is rather a common pain among amputees, and uh, it actually happens in 50 to 80 percent of the amputees. And but, but there are no treatment recommended as clinical. And the phantom limb pain has been hypothesized that to be partially originated from some abnormal activities in the sensory motor cortex here. And uh, uh, one group reported that cortical activation uh, during the mouse movement extended to the hand area here uh, in the phantom limb pain patient. And this overlap between the mouse movement and the hand representation uh, causes the pain. This is the very uh, original uh, maladaptive maladaptation hypothesis. And so, uh, so to improve this kind of maladaptive uh, situation, uh, there are several uh, training has been proposed. So one one uh, famous one is the mirror therapy. So the subject placed the impact hand to show the uh, the mirror image, and the patient try to uh, uh, image the phantom hand movement using this mirror image. And this, the, the aim of this training is to strengthen the phantom hand representation uh, in the motor, sensory motor cortex. So, uh, but the, uh, actually they, they, there is some, there are some uh, clinical trial to show the efficacy of this training, but uh, th this uh, training has shown only about half of the efficacy. I mean, the half of the patient can relieve, relieve the pain. So, uh, but uh, uh, more recently, some other groups uh, proposed some different hypothesis about the uh, origin of the phantom limb pain. So uh, Dr. Tama Makin group uh, reported that cortical activation during the hand movement was stronger 
in the, the patient with stronger pain. So uh, it was suggested that the stronger representation uh, causes the pain. So they also demonstrate that the pain was reduced when the sensory motor activation during the phantom hand was reduced by the stimulation, TDC stimulation. So, uh, so they, they, they propose that the residual hand representation is the cause of the phantom ray pain. Therefore, there, there, uh, there is a, a kind of different hypothesis exist and that each hypothesis are claiming the different uh, direction to reduce the pain. So one, one this, this hypothesis show a uh, claiming that the, the phantom hand representation should be strengthened, but the other group, uh, uh, other group are claiming that this representation should be weakened to reduce the pain. So there are conflicting hypotheses. So uh, to, to, uh, sh to evaluate which hypothesis the, the, the good for the reduction of pain, we, we use the BCI technique, BCI training to control the uh, sensory motor representation of phantom, heart, phantom limb pain. So we developed the BCI using the uh, MEG, magnetoencephalography, and uh, uh, the patient can control this robot hand through his brain activity. So actually, he he has the hand, but the, uh, the he he his uh, nervous uh, his his nerve was blocked at the shoulder, so he cannot move his hand, and he can he do not have uh, any sensation on his hand. But the, uh, when he tried to grasp his right hand, there are activation on the left hemisphere, and uh, this uh, this robot hand was controlled to grasp and open. And then we apply this robot to the phantom limb pain patient to evaluate the, how the motor cortical representation changes and how the pain changes. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, we apply this uh, BCI for the patient to modulate the cortical activity and pain. And in the training, the patient control the robotic hand freely by moving their phantom hand for 10 minutes. And the patient were instructed to improve the accuracy to control the robot. And uh, here is the experimental condition. Uh, first, image signals during the phantom hand movement was recorded and the uh, pain was evaluated by visual analog scale. So visual analog scale is, is a, a very simple way to evaluate pain. So we show the 10 centimeter uh, line to the patient and the, uh, the right side is representing the highest pain and the left side representing the no pain. And the patient marked the, the, their pain intensity in the line. And the uh, uh, BCI training was performed for 10 minutes. Then uh, we evaluate the pain again, the PS, and uh, again, the phantom hand movement task was performed. And, uh, okay. and here, the BCI training, we, we, we did the, this BCI training to control this robotic hand with different decoders. So decoder is the, uh, the AI to infer the uh, activity from the MG signals and uh, control the uh, robotic hand. Uh, we used three decoders. One decoder is a phantom decoder, and it was constructed using the MG signals while moving the phantom hand. And the other one is the random decoder. It was constructed using the same MG signals, but the the level of the movement type was shuff randomly shuffled. So this decoder do not uh, infer the correct movement. And the last one is the real hand decoder. It was constructed using the MEG signals while moving the intact hand. So uh, when we using the phantom decoder, we expect that the phantom representation of the 
the vortex will increase by using this quantum decoder. On the other hand, the real hand decoder is the uh, decoder around the, 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 the intact hand movement. So the, the motor cortical activity of the intact hand is completely different from the phantom hand movement, the cortical representation of phantom hand. So using this decoder to control this robot by imagining the phantom hand, uh, we expected that the phantom hand represent representation uh, deteriorate, reduced uh, uh, using this decoder. And actually, uh, uh, after the training of 10 minutes, the, 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 uh, the phantom hand representation was significantly changed depending on the decoder type. So we evaluate the phantom hand representation using the decoding accuracy from the MEG signals. And the uh, uh, decoding accuracy was improved when we used the phantom decoder. It's very uh, as expected. And the, uh, the random decoder did not change the accuracy and the real hand decoder uh, significantly reduced the accuracy of the phantom hand movement. And interestingly, the pain also significantly changed depending on the, the type of the decoders. So when we use the phantom decoder, the pain significantly increased. And uh, uh, when we use the real hand decoder, the, the pain significantly decreased compared to the random decoder. So uh, as we expected, BCI training uh, can change the, fun, the accuracy of the phantom hand movement, but uh, it's kind of unexpected result, but the pain significantly increased after the BCI training using the phantom decoder. And interestingly, the, the training to weaken the phantom representation uh, reduced the pain. So uh, we have demonstrated that the BCI can change the, fan, the phantom limb pain and also uh, the representation of the phantom hand. And, and uh, then uh, we try to make this kind of feedback training as a treatment for the phantom limb pain. So we apply this BCI training for three days uh, and uh, try to uh, make the more si sustainable and the significant reduction of the pain. And here we use the virtual hand image of the phantom hand. So we take the picture of the intact hand and flip this the picture right, right to left and make, make this kind of uh, hand image of the phantom. And uh, this phantom hand image was controlled by the, 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 the same decoder, uh, I mean the real hand decoder, uh, which, which was trained by the uh, MEG signal during the real hand movement. And uh, from the MEG signals, we estimated the motor cortical activities on the uh, contralateral sensory motor cortex. And uh, uh, we, uh, took the 400 millisecond average of each signals every 200 millisecond. And uh, uh, from using this 400 millisecond time average data, we classify the two types of movement of grasping and opening. And uh, this uh, inferred probability of the opening real hand was used to control this hand image. And uh, we instructed the subject to try to control this virtual phantom image by moving the, their phantom hand. And uh, also in a sham condition, a control condition, this phantom hand image was controlled by a randomly changing value from zero to one. And uh, uh, as I exper in an experiment, uh, we did a randomized single blinded crossover trial. So BCI training versus sham training. And we set the washout period more than three weeks. And during the sham training, uh, yeah, this was. And we entered 12 patients with phantom limb pain uh, due to amputation and the brachial plexal root aversion. And my main outcome was measured by pain reduction after three day trainings. 
And in the three day training, uh, we did uh, uh, 10 three times of 10 minutes training for the first day, six times for second day, and three times for the last day. And uh, the pain was evaluated after the training for uh, 20 days. Okay, so this is the pain deduction during the three day trainings, the day one, day two, day three. In the, in the real training, the, the pain before training uh, was about uh, 40 to 50 in the mean, sorry, as a bus, but it, it significantly decreased after the, uh, the training. And in the second day, the, the VS again significantly decreased after the training. And the third day, this, the training before, uh, the, the pain before the training significantly reduced compared to the, the, the pain in the first day, and the, uh, it, 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 but, but uh, there are no significant deduction after the training. On the other hand, in the sham training, there are no significant reduction be, before and after the training. And uh, as a main outcome, the pain reduction after the uh, fourth day, I mean, the after three day training, the, the pain was significantly reduced after the three day trainings. So before training, there are 40, 45.3, uh, uh, the pain with the 40.3 millimeter uh, evaluated by VS was significantly reduced to the 30.9 in average. On the other hand, in some training, there are no significant difference between the training uh, before and after the training. And uh, th this is the uh, pain changes in uh, uh, after training. So uh, in the red one showing the pain after real training and the blue one showing the pain after sham training. So there are significant difference between these two trainings for five days after the training. So this three day training significant, significantly reduced the pain for five days. And also, uh, the, we evaluated how much the decoding accuracy decreased after the training. So red one, the are training significantly reduced the, uh, the, the decoding accuracy, but the sham training, there are no changes in the uh, decoding accuracy. And also the, the, the difference of the decoding accuracy uh, correlated with the, the reduction of the pain. So large uh, changes in the cortical activity Induce the uh, more reduction in the pain. So uh, this three-day training of so BCI use significantly reduced the phantom limb pain for five days after training, and uh, the the pain reduction was correlated with the reduction of the decoding accuracy of MEG signals during the phantom hand movements. So we succeeded to show that the this induction of cortical reorganization by BCI training was effective to reduce the phantom limb pain sustainably. And uh, uh, BCI is a useful tool to visualize the phantom hand movements and manipulate this uh, the maladapted cortical representation of hand to reduce the pain. Okay. So uh, this is the, uh, the BCI, BCI treatment for phantom limb pain. And uh, I'd like to move on to the next topic, uh, the visual imagery of BCI for the communication. So actually uh, in the phantom limb pain study, uh, we uh, trained the imagery, kind of, kind of imagery of phantom hand movement uh, using the BCI. But uh, for the patient, the, the, this is not the imagery. So for, for them, it's kind of the real. <laughs> so they, they have the real, uh, kind, of, kind of real phantom hunt in their mind. But uh, uh, for us, it's kind of very uh, unusual uh, situation. But uh, uh, e even for the healthy subject, we can Im imagine something in the visual. Visually. So we would like to uh, control such kind of imagery by the BCI. So why we uh, want to control the visual imagery, uh, the, the, the main motivation is comes from the, uh, the communication, communication for the paralyzed patient. 
So as we show that the BCI overcomes the, our body limits, I mean, we don't need the muscle activities for the communication uh, using the BCI. So we, we can sustain the, uh, the communication with the uh, communication using the BCI, even when we lose the, we, we lost the motor function uh, like this, but uh, uh, even such kind of uh, BCI uh, system, they rely on the motor, motor cortex, okay? They, they recorded the motor cortical activities to, to make some, uh, to control some uh, external devices. So they, they are using the motor system. But uh, such motor system is not, so is not a good candidate for the uh, uh, cortical sources for the BCI. So for example, when we apply the ECOG BCI for the CBILS patient in 2013, the ECOG signals of the patient was very unstable during the experiment. We, we, we had so much struggle, struggle with the instability. And also uh, in the recent study, uh, they, the, they also used the motor cortical activity uh, for the uh, communication, but uh, they, they reported that there are considerable uh, variability even in a day, uh, a variability of the neural firing rate in a day. So th this, this is the firing rate during the one day session. So there are so many changes in the uh, firing rate. And uh, uh, this is the success, su success trial of the BCI spelling. So blue, blue one is success and the blue, orange one is unsuccessful one. So, and uh, these are days of the experiment. So, so sometimes good and sometimes bad. So, so there, there are so many uh, unsuccessful day uh, exist. And also uh, they recorded the, uh, the motor neuron activity, motor cortical activities from two sites, uh, just, just motor cortex and the supplemental motor area. But they found that there are no controllable uh, responses in uh, motor cortex. And they used only the activity from the supplementary motor area. So uh, even in this study, the, the motor cortical activity was not good for the uh, control, control of the BCI. So, so because the ALS is the motor degenerative diseases, uh, it, it's kind of obvious. So uh, the, their motor cortical activity is losing. So it's not a good candidate for the BCI for stable use. Therefore, we started the project to create the communication BCI using visual information. So because the visual cortex is known to be preserved even in a progressed ALS patient and can be used for the BCI. And in this project, we are aiming to decode the patient's thoughts from the ECOG signals to present their thoughts as visual image on the monitor. And uh, this work was done by Ryohei, Dr. Ryohei Fukuma in my lab. Uh, this project has been inspired from this uh, previous study. Uh, in 2010, Moran et al. demonstrated that some subject implanted electrode in his uh, hippocampus can control two face images uh, by imagining the person. They recorded the hippocampal activities to some images of famous person and they made a decoder to infer the person from the hippocampal activities. And during the experiment, the subject was presented the image uh, uh, which was overlaid of two, two persons image. And uh, this overlaid image was controlled by the uh, hippocampal activities. And then actually the, the, the patient succeeded to control this superimposed image and uh, imagining the one of these subjects. 
So uh, in this experiment, uh, uh, the visual stimulus induces the, the brain activity and the brain uh, visual stimulus induces the uh, brain activity and uh, this activity changes the visual image. Uh, so, and again, it, it, it changes the, uh, uh, the visual image. So it, it becomes a closed loop system. So this kind of closed loop system affords the subject to control brain activities. But uh, uh, in that experiment, they, they used only two images. Uh, but uh, uh, we'd like to show more kind of more various image by imagery. So how can we control the various image by imagery? So to accomplish, to show the various image, uh, we think that the key is the representational space, which connects between the brain and the various images. Uh, in a general view, our uh, so to to uh, for, for that purpose, we are making the uh, representational space to, to to connect between the brain and the various uh, images. So th there is several ways to make this representational space, but the uh, uh, representational space is a space to connect between the brain and the, uh, to represent the the external uh, 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 environment. And uh, using this space, we can connect the actual real world and the brain activities. For example, uh, Huset created a visual semantic, sorry, visual semantic representation of a natural movie based on the various uh, nouns and verbs labeled with the movie clip like this. So these images were labeled by the each word. And they use this category label as a vector in a representational space. And from these category levels, they infer the brain activities using the regression model. And uh, the, the, this figure shows the, how the brain responded to the semantic difference of the visual stimuli. And the, in this case, the brain activity was predicted from the, this representational space vector. And uh, this is called the encoding model. And similarly, we can infer the the this vector from the brain, uh, and in this case, the, it is called the decoding model. So for both directions, this representational space is the key to connect between the brain and the external world. And uh, also recently, uh, uh, many studies demonstrate that the deep neural network can be a representational space to connect between the brain and the external world. So uh, as you know, deep, deep neural network is a multi-layered neural network, and we can obtain some artificial neural activities as a representation of, for the input of the DNA. For example, when we input this kind of leopard image to the, the deep neural network, uh, we can obtain some uh, activity patterns of the neural network. And uh, of course, this network can predict the, what the image is. And uh, uh, we can use this activity pattern as a vector to represent this image. Uh, so we, we can use the DNN as a representational space. And actually uh, in this work, Dr. Kamitani showed that using this uh, kind of representational space from, based from the DNN, uh, they can reconstruct the image of the presented image from the fMRI activities. So the, the left one is a presented image to the subject and the right one is the reconstructed image from the fMRI. And also interestingly, we can infer the imagery, imagery image from using the, the decoder, decoder made by the perception, uh, uh, made by the perception experiences. So uh, when we apply the, the fMRI, sorry, fMRI during the imagery like this uh, uh, object, they, they, they show that, that they, they can reconstruct these images using the decoder. So uh, the, this kind of success of the reconstruction image is depend, showing that the, some brain activity of imagery and the perception has a shared common neural activities 
and the, uh, the decoder can respond to these kinds of common activation. Okay. So, uh, so based on these previous studies, we constructed a closed loop system to control the various images. At first, we create a decoder to infer the uh, various image. Then we use this decoder in a closed loop condition to let the subject to control the images by their imagery. So we enrolled 17 patients uh, who were implanted the subdural electrodes on their visual cortices like this. And uh, we recorded the ECOG signals while the patient watched a 60 minute video containing various semantic scenes like this image. And then we made a semantic vector representing the semantic relation of the images. First, the video was converted into the scenes for, for each one second. And uh, uh, the, for the, each scene was annotated by some crowd workers. For example, this scene was annotated as the scenery of mountain uh, with snow on the top, blah, blah. And then we extracted some the word from the annotated sentence. And in this case, the word of the scenery, mountain, snow was obtained. Then each word was converted into a thousand dimensional vector uh, by word 2 back. The word 2 back is a very small neural network uh, to, to make the vector from for each word. And the, 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 the constructed vector has some uh, semantic relation of the word. And like this. And then lastly, we averaged all vectors for the word in a sentence to make the semantic vector of this scene. Okay. So we, we, we obtained the, the thousand, 1000 dimensional vector for each scene, and uh, uh, we obtained 3600 uh, scenes for from the 60 minutes video. Then uh, uh, using that uh, vectors, we, we train the decoder to infer the semantic vector from the ECOG signals. So uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and actually uh, the, we evaluated how the uh, ECOG signals responded to the different type of different category of the images. Uh, for example, in a, in a three, this 3600 images distributed in a thousand dimensional semantic space based on the semantic differences. And uh, uh, when we apply the PCA for the thousand dimensional vector space, uh, we can reduce the, the space in a two dimension. And uh, the, the each image distributed in uh, differently. And uh, for example, the face image distributed here, and uh, a landscape image distributed here, and uh, the image with the word distributed around here. So there are some clusters of the image uh, depending on the semantic differences. And for these different uh, semantic, uh, uh, for, the, for these uh, different images, the 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 ECOG activity also different, uh, and th these are showing the high gamma activity of the ECOG signals on each electrode, and uh, we can see that these high gamma activities significantly different among three types of the uh, images. So uh, we can say that the, uh, the ECOG signal responding to the, the difference of the semantic difference. And then we infer the semantic vector uh, from the ECOG signals on one second at the timing that image was presented. Uh, we extracted again the high gamma power of ECOG signals and the linear regression was applied for the decoding. And the uh, uh, infer the semantic vector was uh, significantly correlated with the vector for the 13 component of PCA component. So, so this is the component of the PCA component and uh, for for example for the first component we can predict the uh, the, the changes in the uh, PCA1 component from the issue of the signals and that 
that changes significantly correlate with the actual changes on the PC1. And the 13 components was predicted from the HOG signals. And also we can classify the, what, uh, the, the three types of the uh, image category, for example, the landscape and the face and the scenery. Uh, sorry, uh, word. And uh, using the issues these signals, we can classify these three types of the image with the 70% of accuracy. Then uh, we uh, infer the, uh, and also we can infer the word from the predicted semantic vector. For example, when the, uh, the patient watched this movie, we can predict the, the word from the the issue the signals, uh, uh, you, we can predict the word from the infrared semantic vector, uh, which is close to the, this word. And also uh, based on this uh, prediction, we can select the image from the 3600 image, uh, which is close to the infrared vector. And uh, 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 actually the infrared uh, seeing, it, it, has the same similar meaning to, to the presented movie. So the, the light, light side image is the uh, infrared image from the issue of the signal and the left one is a presented image. So when we present the scenery, the scenery image was infrared. Then uh, lastly, uh, we, we present the, the infrared image to the subject then uh, we made a closed loop condition using this train decoder. And the, uh, the, the subject was instructed to show the, the image uh, representing the instructed meaning, uh, such as the uh, word human face or landscape. Uh, this video shows the uh, example of online control of the image. The, okay. When the subject was instructed to show the landscape, this kind of landscape image was presented based on the infrared vectors. And uh, when, we, when the subject was instructed to show the human face, some image with the human face was presented as by the imagery. And for the instruction to show the word, the subject shows an image with word. Okay. So actually he succeeded to show the image of the instructed meaning with accuracy from 55 to 73.75%. And to evaluate this accuracy, we evaluated how much the patient controlled the inferred semantic vectors following the instructions. To demonstrate the controllability of the inferred semantic vector, we visualized the inferred vector in two dimensional PCA, PCA component estimate from the southern dimensional space. So this is the, the same PCA deduction space. And in this two dimensional space, the, uh, the we tracked the, the position of the inferred vectors. So yellow dot shows the, uh, infer, the position of inferred uh, vectors. And when we uh, instruct to show the human face, the vector go into the cluster of the human face. So the patient succeeded to control their uh, inferred vector to the human face. Uh, yeah, sometimes go into the more long direction. And in, in under the instruction of word, the, the vector go into the cluster around the word. And uh, for the instruction to show the landscape, the, the inferred vector go into the, the landscape direction. And uh, we evaluated how, how much the inferred vector grows to the instruction. Uh, uh, we, we made an instruction vector, which is the word to vector word to back vector of instructed word. So, I mean, the human face, the word of human face has the one vector. So we make the correlation between the, this vector and the inferred vector as a uh, similarity between the inferred and the instruction vectors. And the bottom uh, figure shows the uh, 
similarity between them. And uh, actually, uh, when the when we instruct the landscape, the similarity for the landscape is increased. And uh, this is the summary of the for the one patient uh, under the instruction of word, the similarity to the word increased during the two cross loop condition and the lands in the under the uh, instruction word landscape, the uh, cross the closeness to the landscape increased. And uh, actually the accuracy for the three classification reached around 60 to 50, 60%. And uh, for among the PCA component, five PCA components were significantly controlled by the imagery. And uh, lastly, we evaluated how the inferred semantic vector changes by the imagery while the sub watches the images of different categories. So we presented the image of landscape and what to two kinds of image. Then for each image, the, the similarity between the inferred vector and the instruction vector of, of the word and landscape was evaluated and plotted in this uh, through the two-dimensional uh, plot. And in this figure, a blue point shows corresponds to the ECOG while uh, subject watching the landscape image and the red point shows the uh, corresponds to the word image. So uh, when the, the subject just watching uh, the image without imagery, these two image, uh, the, these two ECOG signals are separately uh, distributed in this uh, closeness or sorry, uh, similarities. But when the subject uh, imagine the different category, for example, uh, they while they watch the uh, landscape image, when they uh, at, the, at that time they imagine the uh, word, then this blue point go up to the uh, up direction. That means the, the closeness to the word uh, increase. So th there is a difference of the uh, word direction similarity of the word direction. And we, we said that we call this difference as a modulation by the imagery. And actually uh, among the nine patients, there are significant modulation by the imagery was observed for, sorry, uh, for both the landscape and the uh, uh, word. So uh, we demonstrate that the subject can control the semantic vector representing the visual semantic information by imagery in a closed loop condition. And we think this is the kind of interaction between the semantic representation and the brain through the decoding. Therefore, we are calling this as a representation of brain computer interaction or RBCI. And although the accuracy was not enough yet, uh, this RBCI will be applied for the communication without motor function. So as uh, a summary, uh, various visual semantic information was decoded from initial Z signals and uh, through the visual semantic representation space and using the semantic decoder in a closed loop condition, the patient were able to control the decoded image to show the instructed meaning. And uh, 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 so we, I introduced two BCI in a, so, uh, two BCI that visualize the imagery contents and manipulate the representation corresponding to the contents. Well, for the phantom limb pain, the BCI was able to visualize the phantom hand in their mind to train the corresponding representation. And for the visual semantic representation, BCI visualized the semantic contents of the visual perception of the subject and uh, let subject to manipulate the perception by their imagery. And in a sense, this system is externalizing the Cartesian theater of the subject to manipulate it by themselves. So uh, these BCI is uh, externalizing the representation of human body, perception, and imagery to make them intentionally controllable and measurable. So this property of BCI will be useful to uh, understand our consciousness. So uh, the conclusion, BCI visualize or externalize the internal representation of our perception, intentional, and the imagery, and enables the subject to manipulate them by subject themselves to understand our brain and to cure the neuropsychiatric diseases. 
Uh, this work was supported by many funding and including the Moonshot project and uh, uh, many collaborators. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, uh, I hope there are some questions. Thank you.